Good evening. I hope you're all enjoying the Literature Festival. Uh, how many of you had a chance to go over to the bookstore and see our scanning operation? Has anybody seen that? A few of you? Um, it, it's it's uh, quite an event. Uh, we, we have uh, 25 people involved in setting up. Uh, we have four scanners on site and they're scanning 800 um, pages an hour. We've actually scanned 50,000 pages of material during the Literature Festival. And I, my thanks to my colleague Om Shiva Prakash, who is the co-founder of the Servants of Knowledge Initiative on putting this all together. Uh, what you're seeing over there, um, in addition to the four scanners, uh, which we manufacture here in Bangalore, are a whole bunch of books. And I'm going to talk about what those books are and why it's important to scan them. Our headquarters is over at Gandhi Bhavan. And over there, uh, we've pulled 25% of our capacity to bring it on site for the uh, Literature Festival. Uh, these scanners, like I said, do 500 to 800 pages an hour. Uh, the scans are very high quality. We uh, scan 15 locked pages every month, and we've done about two crore pages this year so far. In addition to Om Shiva Prakash, uh, several of my other colleagues are here tonight. Uh, Lawrence Lang is dean of the law school um, at Ambikar University, Delhi. Uh, he's one of the leading lights in the field of intellectual property. Uh, Dr. Sushant Sinha is here tonight and he runs the amazing Indian Kanoon site for free access to court cases in India. So what are we scanning here at the LitFest? There's an amazing set of historical reprints from the 1700s and 1800s uh, that were published by the Asian Educational Services. Uh, they went out of business. And so we've had volunteers scouring the bookstores for old copies um, to scan them. We want to save them. We want to preserve them for prosperity. We had 431 of their books online already. This week, we went over to Church Street and we staged a buy-in at Blossoms, uh, found another 107 volumes, and we're scanning those here on site. You'll also see a bunch of books from Motilal Banarsidas uh, Publishing House. They're the oldest publishing house in India. And I'm really pleased to announce today that we've signed a memorandum of cooperation with them. Abhi Jain, the creative director, is here. At the, Lit Fest, at the Lit Fest, we are scanning all 50 volumes of the Sacred Books of the East by Max Mueller. Um, our agreement with them is that they're going to ship us lots of books that are out of copyright. We scan them, we return them, and then in return, we put a backlink uh, to their site on the books that we display on the Internet Archive. We also send them a digital copy. It's a terrific arrangement. It's a, it's a classic win-win kind of arrangement. Uh, this all came about because the government of India, in their now defunct Digital Library of India project, scanned a bunch of their books. But they did a really bad job. The scans aren't great. Uh, they got the metadata like titles and dates wrong, and oops, they put up a bunch of books that were still in copyright. Before the government server crashed, I made a copy of the Digital Library of India, and I have it up on the Internet Archive. For several years now, we've been combing through the material, culled out in, uh, culling out the in-copyright books, uh, fixing all the mistakes that the government did in the metadata. Uh, Abhi Jain had contacted the Internet Archive to see if something could be done about his books. And since I'm the one that had done all the uploading, they sent them my way. Uh, Abby and I hit it off, and I'm really delighted we were able to put this deal together. Uh, I have a second announcement to make, which is we're now working with another publisher, uh, Canada University Humpy. They're sending us a whole slew of magazines and textbooks uh, that they publish, and we're going to put those online. And, and we work with a number of other publishers, and I think it's important to mention that uh, because we're going to be talking about Gyan Satyagraha in a few minutes. So you may ask, um, who, who are these scanners? Uh, what, what is the Servants of Knowledge, and why we, why we want to do a, a Gyan Satyagraha? And so let me tell you a little bit about ourselves. And then I want to talk about Gyan Swaraj and why we need Satyagraha in this age of information. I've been in the information liberation trade for all my career. So what I do is public work. It's nonprofit, non-commercial. And over 10 years ago, I started coming to India on a regular basis. Uh, by 2019, I was spending 150 nights a year in Indian hotel rooms. In fact, I was on my second trip to India when, when COVID hit. I, I had landed in, in, um, in Delhi. And a day later, I was back on the plane heading home, and I, I got there just in time before they started shutting down airports. Uh, the Servants of Knowledge India 
uh, 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 initiative got our first home at the Indian Academy of Sciences. Um, we agreed to digitize their materials and also a bunch of other scientific information from places like the CSRI laboratories. In return, they let us work out of their basement. They gave us a home. We then added a scanner over in Chennai at the Roja Muthaya Library and helped them scan a bunch of Tamil books. And with the help of Bangalore's own Mohandas Pai, we put a scanner at the World Konkani Center and helped them digitize over 5,000 Konkani books. We kept on scanning through COVID, but we wanted to consolidate our scanners all in one place. And we had also started manufacturing our scanners here in India the ones you see over at the bookstore. Uh, we have a total of 15 scanners now, and we approached the Vice Chancellor of the National Law School of India University. He gave us a nice facility, and we have scanned their entire law school library. We've scanned over 30,000 of their books. For all the stuff we scan, if it's in the public domain, we make it available so anybody can download it. If the books are in copyright, we're very careful about them and make them available to the blind and print disabled in other uses as permitted by law. And I'll talk more about that in just a bit. After we finished the NS NLSIU library, we were thrilled when Gandhi Bhavan offered us a spacious set of rooms. That's our new headquarters and they've been very gracious. We love our new home. Uh, Gandhi Bhavan even invited me to give the keynote speech at the Gandhi Jayanti ceremonies. It was a thrill to be on the same stage with so many freedom fighters and your chief minister. Um, when the Honorable Sidhu G uh, took office, he told people not to give him flowers, but to give him books instead. And so at the ceremony, I presented him with a USB drive with uh, 333 books, including the collected works of Mahatma Gandhi, uh, the Desai Diaries, and Navi Jivan Trust pamphlets, and much more. He smiled, and I think he was impressed. I hope he was. Uh, we've been scanning many, many other things all over Bangalore. Old Canada books from the BM Sri Patrasana Library, uh, community health information from Sochara. Uh, it's a wonderful NGO here in Bangalore. In addition to all the stuff we're scanning here, we've been doing extensive digital harvesting uh, of other open access sites, uh, partly just to make sure they're properly preserved. Uh, as I told you, the Digital Library of India server crashed, so we now have the only copy of that database online. Um, but also to make, make better search engines and tools available. So many of these government sites, for example, have not done OCR, they just post images of, of the books. And so we run them through optical character recognition, we make them searchable inside of the book, we make them searchable across the collections. Um, so if you want to search the West Bengal Public Library, the Tamil Virtual Academy, and the Digital Library of, of, of India all at once and see if your book is perhaps there, we allow you to do that. So you might ask why all this Gandhian rhetoric? Um, our motto is scanning is the new spinning. And you may know about Gandhi's push for spinning. He called that bread labor, a concept he took from the Bible, uh, which says, by the sweat of thy brow shalt thou earn thy bread. And bread labor for Gandhi means you should do manual labor every day. So in India, cotton farmers and indigo farmers were forced to send their output to England, where it was put into finished goods and then sold back to people in India. And Gandhi's Swadeshi campaign was meant to break that vicious cycle, spinning the cotton locally and turning it into finished goods here. What many people don't realize, though, was that Gandhi practiced bread labor in South Africa, but it wasn't spinning. It was typesetting. Gandhi started gathering news from around the world, adding commentary, and he printed those materials to educate the community, and it was through that education that they gained a common purpose and won their Satyagraha campaign in South Africa. At the Phoenix Ashram, everybody had bread labor, and that bread labor was typesetting. Even the children were typesetters as part of their education. Gandhi was typesetting every day as well, and he admitted he wasn't very good at it. He described himself as a dunce when it came to typesetting and printing. He was a great writer, though. Um, he did it anyway, though, because everybody has to participate if they are to raise themselves up as a community. An educated citizenry is the key to democracy. It was crucial for the liberation of India. It was also crucial for our civil rights campaign in the United States. And so let me tell you a little bit about the US first before I turn back to India. In the US, around 1900, we started to get some beautiful public libraries built. They were funded by a robber baron named Andrew Carnegie, richest man in the world, and he decided to give money towards public libraries. And they were beautiful. 
but many of them didn't allow blacks or other people of color in. Carnegie didn't want to offend local feelings among the white elite. The motto of the program was free for all, but all was not everybody. In Atlanta, Georgia, in 1902, Carnegie gave money for an amazing library, the, the Carnegie Library of Atlanta. Huge pillars, beautiful, beautiful facility. W.E.B. Du Bois, the noted scholar and leader of an early civil rights movement, wrote to the library board and said the library should be integrated. The answer he got back was that Negroes would not be permitted to use the Carnegie Library of Atlanta. They also told him no African Americans would be allowed on the library board. After a lot of complaining and lobbying and insisting, the library said they would build a separate library for African Americans. They took their time and it wasn't until 1921 that the colored library was built. It was much smaller, far less grand, the budget was tiny. The librarian, Annie McFeeters, uh, started an adult education program there and she used her own meager salary to buy more books. Annie McF McFeeters tells a really interesting story. In 1938, a nine-year-old boy who lived two blocks from the library came in and he selected two big heavy books and he walked up to Annie's desk and pushed them across, showed her his library card. The books were considered adult books and he had a kid's library card. Uh, Annie told him that the boy should run home and find his father's library card and she'd let him have those books. The name of that little boy was Martin Luther King Jr. and both the books were about Gandhi. I told that story to Ram Guha and he said, no, that's not possible. Uh, Martin Luther King did not learn about Gandhi until he got to Howard University, in, until he got to the university. Um, so I showed him the oral uh, uh, transcripts of Annie McFeeters, uh, which I found on the internet. And so I was able to tell Ram something about Gandhi he didn't know, uh, which I, I felt very happy. Um, <laughs> Um, Atlanta was one of the few cities in the South that had colored libraries. In almost all the South, people of color were not allowed in at all. Uh, by 1954, that was still the situation. This is 50 years into the public library movement. Uh, the Supreme Court had passed the Brown versus Board of Education opinion that said separate but equal wasn't good enough. And of course, even when schools and buses and libraries and playgrounds were separate for blacks, they were never equal. Even with that Supreme Court pronouncement, there was massive resistance in the South. The Civil Rights Movement knew that education was a key underpinning of progress. They started to stage read-ins at libraries. In Danville, Virginia, 12 students staged a read-in at the library. They were refused service and thrown out. They sued. A judge ruled the library must immediately integrate, so Danville simply closed the library instead. Same thing happened in other cities. In Albany, Georgia, the police padlocked the library to prevent African Americans from gaining entrance. When they were forced to remove the padlocks by a judge, they decided to institute vertical integration. And what that means is they removed all the tables and chairs so blacks and whites couldn't sit down together. In Montgomery, Alabama, where Rosa Parks took her famous bus ride, it was even more tense. Integration sparked a huge amount of Ku Klux Klan activity. When the judge ordered integration, the city again removed all the tables and chairs. But young children came to the library anyway, and they brought tables and chairs from home and brought them into the library so that they could sit down. When whites showed up to use the library as well, the Klan started walking around and threatening them, writing down their license plate numbers. The police were doing the same things to intimidate them. In Anniston, Alabama, when the city decided to integrate, two black ministers were chosen to be the first patrons. An angry crowd of racists brutally attacked them. Chains, clubs, knives, and a few hours away that same day in Birmingham, a bomb went off at the 16th Street Baptist Church killing four little black girls. Libraries are about education, not just for children, but for everybody. Our civil rights movement realized that, and the same is true here in India. The library movement and the broader right to education went hand in hand with the liberation of India. In Baroda, 
an enlightened Maharaja built a central library, which by 1913 had 40,000 books on the shelves, another 25,000 more in storage waiting for a place to put them. Of the 426 large villages, 216 had their own libraries. There were 140 traveling libraries going throughout the state. In Andhra, the library movement was the center of the development for Swaraj in that state. In 1924, the Hindu wrote that the typical Andhra library is not a mere storehouse of books, but is a center from which all heavy activities of the village, social, religious, literary, and in some cases political, also proceed. By 1920, there were 600 libraries in Andhra. In Tamil Nadu, a young man named Rangarathan sparked a statewide library movement, and he became a leading light worldwide in library science. His five laws of library science are repeated constantly um, in library classes. He said that schools should acquaint students with books and how to read them and use them for the rest of their lives. You didn't get your education in school, you learn how to teach yourself. Ranganathan wrote in the Hindu and saying that, that the education and learning had deep roots in Indian culture. He pointed out to a 10, uh, 1058 AD Kannada inscription at a temple near Wadai where a 60-pillared temple had been established with a residential college. Uh, the inscription on the pillar noted that there were three Vedic teachers, three Shasta teachers, and six librarians that were employed at, at this college. The Maharaja of Baroda did more than just libraries. He established schools and scholarships. Indeed, he found a young man named B.R. Ambedkar. He sent him to America to get a PhD, and then on to London to get a second PhD and a law degree. In the U.S., Ambedkar read voraciously. In 1916, while studying at Columbia, he read in the Bombay Chronicle that the city was going to erect a statue in honor of Feroz Shah Mehta. He wrote a letter to the Bombay municipality saying such a statue would be very trivial and unbecoming and that the fittest and most lasting memorial would be to build a library. As you know, the depressed classes in most of India not only could not share water facilities and temples with the other castes, they were not allowed in schools. When they were allowed an education, they had to sit on the veranda away from the other children and out of hearing uh, from the teachers. Ambedkar felt deeply about the right to education. He grew up in a military family, and his father collected many manuscripts and books, but his household was a rarity. For Ambedkar, as with Gandhi, liberation only came when the community educated itself about the particulars of their situation. He spoke about how the Raj practiced government for the people. They made trans trains run fast, albeit only to expropriate the raw materials of India back to England. It was an efficient government, but it was not a just government. But a government for the people was not enough for a successful democracy. You need government by the people. He wrote that the continued oppression of the untouchables had to be countered, and at the same time their awareness had to be built so that they threw away their apathy, became agitated about the injustice they were suffering. When the Raj adopted a policy of mass education, they did the same thing as we did in the US. Care was taken not to offend the sensibilities of the upper classes, so they adopted a policy of separate schools. And in many cases, if not both cases, those separate schools were simply not built. I'm sure many of you will grant me that education was crucial for raising awareness to, to integrate societies and to liberate them in the last century. But why is it relevant in our modern age? I put it to you today that all too often we have government for the people, not government by the people. We have, we have what my friend Tim O'Reilly calls vending machine government. You, you, you deposit your taxes in the slot and you get your government back out on the bottom. And I also put it to you today that knowledge has become colonized. For years I've been giving lectures around India at law schools, IIT campuses, regional colleges. I always ask people if they have access to the information they need to finish their education and do their research. The answer is always no. Scientific and scholarly information has been sequestered behind paywalls. When I ask students, professors, and even vice chancellors in scientific institutions, how many of them use Sci-Hub to find information? Every single hand goes up. Public knowledge has become private property, and even public knowledge funded by the government has become hidden and then mined to maximize returns, and I believe that's a sin. Copyright 
is often referred to as intellectual property, but that's an awful term. Even if it is property, as Gandhi teaches us, if one accumulates great wealth, and that includes knowledge, one holds it in trust for the people. Copyright is not property, it is a trust. Uh, many of you copyright as, as a binary thing. You have it or you don't. If you have it, you tell people what they can do. And that's not the case. Um, it, it, copyright, it, the purpose of copyright is the infusion and diffusion of knowledge, right? It, it is meant to give people an incentive to write, but the, the purpose of it is the diffusion of public knowledge. And the Copyright Act of India is a wonderful example of post-colonial legislation. Right? When things such as the penal code were inherited from the Raj, the Copyright Act was crafted by the new government from scratch, and it was with the purpose of making knowledge flourish in India. If you look at the Copyright Act, you will see that in addition to the limited rights granted to authors, there are a huge number of exceptions. This is known as fair dealing. Libraries have right, for example, to make copies to archive. If you're blind, copyright does not apply at all. I can give you a copy of any book if you are blind. Likewise, if in the course of the research you need a book, I am allowed under the Copyright Act to furnish you that book to further your research. And as we learned in the Delhi University case, if students are furnished materials such as course packs in the course of instruction, copyright also does not apply. But despite that, knowledge has become sequestered and it's become a tool of commerce and even of diplomacy. And when the United States started selling low price subsidized old textbooks in India so that Indian publishers couldn't make a profit having a new book created from scratch by an Indian author. Today's world with so much knowledge being treated as property, we have to be aggressive if we wish to change that. Knowledge, I believe, is the key to democracy and the key to future. Uh, Indian students, uh, in, in, indeed all the people of India, because students are lifelong learners, so everybody is a student, should be able to further their education and access the currency of our modern era, information. I have been, um, so I, I've given an example of the colonialization of knowledge, right? Western companies having scientific research. Uh, but you know, uh, there are a lot of other examples out there. One of the things that we do at the Servants of Knowledge Initiative is um, the government of India has copyright in books, right? They're the largest publisher in India. They sell the books at vastly subsidized prices. Uh, we go to government bookstores and we buy every single government book we can. We have 630 books from the publications division in Delhi, for example. We put them online. We say they're for non-commercial use and for furthering the education of people in India. We get a takedown notice sometimes from government agencies and we send them back an answer and we say, listen, uh, this is non-commercial use. You don't have any e-books online. Would you like a copy of our scans back for your website? And then we politely decline to remove those books. And that to me is an example of a satyagraha. Uh, we just finished a 10 year campaign in which we bought every single Indian standard from the Bureau of Indian Standards. We posted them online. The Bureau objected. We sued them in the High Court of Delhi. And just last year, the Bureau started making every Indian standard available for free for download. Yeah. We went to the judge and said, that's what we wanted in the first place. We drop our lawsuit. So education is the foundation of democracy, and I, I'm going to close here with a, a few more comments. I believe that only when the people educate themselves can change occur. If our government does not believe in climate change, we must educate ourselves and stand up and demand they do something. If we believe growing economic inequality has reached catastrophic proportions, only the people can change that situation. If we believe that all citizens must have equality of status and of opportunity, those are empty words if the means to achieve that are unavailable. If we believe all citizens must be able to practice the profession of their choice, how can they do that if they don't have the means to educate themselves on that profession? If we are to have liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith and worship, where in the preamble does it say that rights, those rights are conditional upon possession of an American Express gold card? Everybody has heard school children recite Gitanjali 35, Tagore's eloquent uh, cry of let my country awake. But look at those words carefully from the frame of access to knowledge. That poem is about a world where knowledge is free. 
It's about one where words come out from the depth of truth. It's about a country where the mind is led forward into ever widening thought and action. That poem is about access to knowledge. If we believe disinformation is a pandemic spread by the internet, the only cure is better information. If we believe government is currently the tool of corporate insiders, all we can do is educate ourselves and seize the reins of power. Walls around knowledge are the tools of oppression. Access to knowledge is a human right. We must fight. Change does not come rolling in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes only with continuous struggle. That's a Martin Luther King quote. In the information age, Gyan Satyagaha will help light up that crooked path that stands between us and that shining city on the hill. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we can do one question. Make it a good one. Ma'am. <laughs> that was a marvelous presentation. Just one query. We are at a literary book fest and there is a need for the copyright protection of the authors. And here you're rooting for copy left. How would you reconcile the two? Thank I actually you. would disagree. Um, we are not rooting for copy left. Um, so we are strong believers in the protection of copyright with a couple exceptions such as works of the Indian government paid for by your tax dollars. But books that are in copyright, we only make them available to the blind. Most of our work is public domain books, and we approach publishers and authors on a regular basis and say, would you like your book scanned and put online? And in many cases, um, people write for, for uh, fame, not, 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 not richness. Many books don't sell at all, and what happens is they sell a few copies, and then they don't sell anymore. And so many people where the book has run its commercial course are very happy to have us scan the books. I was a professional writer for many years. I've written nine books. I made a living off my royalties. And so we respect copyright, but we think it's swung way too far to the right. And we think that there needs to be a balancing of those interests. And that, that especially is the case with publicly funded research, which is then locked up behind private paywalls. Remember, scientists don't get paid for writing their research papers, right? They're university professors. They do it for free. Um, the editors do it for free. Uh, the publishers then take that and they charge absurd prices. And I think that's worth fighting to counter that. So thank you.